Okay, we are cooking with gas. Okay, so um, we are continuing our look at Haydn's music. Well, actually, uh, finishing up our look at Haydn's music with looking at the string quartets. So um, this is actually a pretty timely. I mean, it's kind of another uh, survey that encompasses uh, Haydn's life, but it kind of covers works, uh, later works, uh, towards the end of his life as well, which I don't know, I think is kind of fitting as we finish our look at Haydn. Uh, just so everybody knows, um, I think it's likely that our Mozart group uh, will be postponing their presentation. So I, I have decided to uh, continue or to uh, have our class on Friday be centered around uh, Mozart string quartets, which honestly uh, might be a good fit uh, after our Haydn quartets. But uh, I'll, I'll let you know the details of that plan once they solidify. So, uh, our, our look into Haydn string quartets. If you don't know already, Haydn is often referred to loving, lovingly as the father of the string quartet. So, we credit Haydn for being responsible for fashioning this genre in its modern form, which is to say that he, A, solidifies like the texture, of the instruments involved. So two violins, one cello, or two, sorry, two violins, one viola, one cello. Um, and B, he solidifies the movement structure, which uh, in, its, in its standard form is four movements, um, which vary in character, but are understood to be understood together, if that makes sense. So, um, just tracing not only the development of the string quartet, but uh, Haydn's contribution to it. So around 1750 to 1770, um, uh, I guess starting with 1750, you know, we're, we're still thinking in terms of like transitioning from the Baroque period. So uh, traditionally, and maybe Baroquely speaking, uh, the quartet, has the texture of like two violins and basso continuo. And this is reminiscent of the Baroque trio sonata, uh, where we have like a prominence of two uh, violin uh, voices over like the harmonic support of basso continuo. So over the course of 20 years or so, this ensemble turns into a uh, being made up of four equal voices. So our four strings, our two violins, our viola, and our cello. There's also a change in terminology. Um, so it, it's hard to say for sure uh, like where string quartets started, but um, we do have uh, quote unquote quartets that come from late Italian Baroque composers. And uh, what's interesting about these is that they're technically quartets, but some of them include like winds and they still include basso continuo, like in addition to strings. So maybe you have a quartet made up of a flute, two violins, and basso continuo, um, which might be played on uh, most likely a harpsichord. So that's that's kind of like the beginnings of our quartet. Um, so like I said, the terminology kind of changes and quartets start to be referred to as divertimentos, which we can understand as like divertisements. Um, divertimentos kind of have this connotation of being like light and simple pieces. And Haydn did write divertimentos, which are essentially quartets. And I think that's how we need to understand them, is that they're not just like light or simple, you know, to be squeezed in during more serious performances of more serious works, but they were actually starting to hold their own um, earlier on. So it's generally not until the 1770s that these works become weightier, 
and they're fully fledged form movement pieces. And what's really extraordinary about these is that there's extensive motivic development. And um, I want you to consider, like we talked so much about the contrast that's available and present uh, in Haydn symphonies. And while that's true, it's, it's also noticeable that in the symphonies, there's not a lot of motivic development. I mean, we do have our, our standard themes, you know, like in a sonata allegro form, like in a first movement, but the attention is really more on contrast between like textures, so maybe pairings of instruments, and then dynamics as well. So Haydn really uses the quartet as a vehicle for exploring uh, motivic development and just uh, looking at motives and themes and playing with them as, as much as he can. Uh, I, I invite anyone to actually answer, but has anyone heard of Wolfgang von Goethe? I'm gonna look at your faces. Yay, I'm seeing some head nodding. No, I'm seeing some head shaking and that's cool too. <laughs> um, so Goethe. Goethe is, uh, or was, a German poet, and um, he's really tied close to the arts, um, especially music. Um, a lot of his uh, poems were set by Schubert, actually. Um, so Goethe is alive around the same time um, as Haydn is comp composing string quartets. Uh, and he refers to the quartets as, quote unquote, a conversation among four intelligent people. And I love this because our anthology and textbook, <laughs> or the anthology um, has that quote. But um, so our anthology says, this new genre differed dramatically from the trio sonata, which is true. Uh, the trio sonata was at best a dialogue monopolized by the violin and cello and at worst, a soliloquy by the violin. So, I mean, not, not to knock our, our uh, violin friends here, but uh, maybe, maybe we can kind of hear that uh, from like the trio sonatas uh, we've listened to uh, within uh, our, our earlier studies here. So the point about that is that this is a conversation and that the string quartet is more about equality of the voices within that conversation. So let's think about that as we listen to these pieces today. And we definitely want to listen for ways in which Haydn is playing with uh, very varying uh, motives and themes. So uh, we're looking at Opus 20 first, uh, written circa 1772. It's comprised of six quartets. Uh, we'll be listening to a movement from number five shortly here. Um, so these quartets, they're both witty and serious. And honestly, that's a lot of, uh, a lot of works by Haydn. Um, I always feel like Haydn is making musical jokes sometimes. <laughs> it, and it's, it's hard to pinpoint like how that exactly sounds or how that exactly operates, but when you hear it, you know it, or you know it when you hear it, one of the, one of the two there. Um, on the more serious side, uh, these works exhibit Sturm und Drang style, so storm and stress. Uh, so this uh, has to do kind of like an Finzom style, if we can recall our, our CPE folks uh, presentation has to do with uh, sensitivity, but um, that is to say being like dramatic. So maybe we can hear some drama and some passion in the movement we're listening to. And what's more is that the movement we're listening to reintroduces counterpoint. Yay! So <laughs> counterpoint doesn't uh, disappear with our, you know, changing uh, preferences and styles in our classical period, so to speak. 
So three of the quartets in Opus 20 have fugal finales, and that's actually what we're listening to. Uh, so we'll be listening to number five and the final movement. Um, it's like three minutes long. I think, I think we should listen to it, uh, the whole thing. The other thing here is that I think it'd be good for us to see people uh, playing together because maybe we can get more of a sense of uh, the conversational aspects uh, of the quartet. So anyways, um, whew, hopefully that's not too loud. I am sharing my computer audio, so uh, just uh, hop in the chat if you can't hear it or it seems a little bit odd. But anyways, okay, so here is one of our fugal finales, uh, Haydn String Quartet in F minor, Opus 20, number five. between our voices there. Um, so this, this is a better example of like the storm and stress aspects of uh, Haydn's writing and maybe less on like the joking side. But um, let's see here. What, what string players do we have with us today? We have Haley. Who else? Am I forgetting people? Mm -mm. Oh wait, wait, Nick, Nick Schellenberg? You're a bassist, right? <laughs> All right, I'm gonna stop singling people out. Okay, uh, so let us go on. 
So uh, now it comes to uh, Opus 33, uh, and we'll actually be holding score uh, with one of these, uh, well, with one of the movements from one of the quartets. So we're traveling a little bit back in time. Uh, the symphonies kind of follow Haydn's uh, end of tenure with the Esterhazy family. So uh, Opus 33 kind of takes us back when he's still working with them. Uh, so he's he was constantly trying to work out contracts, as I, I said in our last class, just thinking of ways uh, to make money, uh, to live. <laughs> uh, so he, in, his, in a new contract in 1779, he uh, is allowed uh, to publish uh, music with the Eskerhazis, and he publishes Opus 33, which he actually advertised as written in an entirely new and special way. And um, what, what we think Haydn means by this is just talking about his continuation of really emphasizing motivic development. Because uh, he was already um, writing in, in the standard, uh, like, uh, for instrument texture, uh, two violins, one viola, one cello. Uh, for these or, uh, quartets. So it's, it's assumed that he is talking about his motivic development. Um, one cool thing about uh, Opus 33, number two, which is called The Joke, which is great. Uh, the second movement uh, would be assumed to be a minuet, but Haydn replaces it with a scherzo, which I don't know if you've encountered a scherzo in your your own musical journeys, but those are like uh, they're they're pieces in um, they're pieces in three, like a minuet. But the scherzo kind of has more of a really like joking kind of approach. Uh, we're actually going to listen to the fourth movement uh, of this opus, so Opus Thirty Three, Number Two. Um, we're listening to the last movement just because. Uh, we still get a sense of like conversation and uh, well, you'll definitely get a sense of motivic development uh, with this one.
definitely get a sense of uh, the joking aspect of Haydn's writing. So we also, um, we have more, or we can go more in depth uh, with looking at like motivic development when we actually hold score. So uh, we'll, we're still in Opus 33. Uh, what we heard was from number two, the joke, and this is number three, the bird. So, um, like I said, we'll hold score with this, and uh, I, I think we should uh, just try to talk about what we heard afterwards, uh, you know, like we always do. <laughs> but uh, I, I'm just really curious uh, about your impressions about this piece, uh, about this movement. Um, maybe we could talk more about how Haydn develops the motives, the themes, or if you found anything uh, ridiculous or remarkable, uh, we can talk about that too. All right, so here is the first movement from The Bird.
everybody's favorite part. What did you think? <laughs> Observations uh, that we we have on this piece. I actually wanted to say from the beginning, um, Haydn quartets, when you're just forming a quartet group, they're generally used as a basis to start off with because they're a lot more simplistic mm -hmm. in like their dynamics and what's required of you. So it's a lot easier to generate a group sound and put yeah. figure out style wise like how you want to play so yeah. I think that's like what everyone starts on when they start out with quartet group I had no idea that it was kind of like the standard yeah you go it's usually Haydn or Mozart because they're a lot easier to okay. figure out okay that makes a lot of sense Were there any things that uh, surprised folks as we were listening and looking at the score? 
it's really subtle. I mean, I'm not saying like we're we're listening to this as like groundbreaking, uh, totally unexpected like use of harmonies, but it is kind of surprising. Like some of the harmonies that Haydn does choose to go to, like. Uh, let me see if I can be more specific. Um, it has to do with like the opening like ostinato eighth notes. Um, okay, like right here, we're kind of, it looks like we might be centering around B flat. Uh, we have uh, B flat major. So we have B flat in um, our viola, a D in our second violin, but then we kind of play around in G minor for a bit. And like, if you think about it, like the move from C major to G minor is not, I, I mean, it, it's kind of out there because if you think about like the key signature of G minor, you know, B flat and E flat, it's a little bit further away uh, it, it's not as close to C major as it could be, you know. So it's a, it's a little out there. But again, I'm not saying it's like, uh, you know, we're not we're not looking at a jump from like, um, you know, tonality to like Schoenberg or something. But and I think we can definitely hear how this would be a standard for putting quartets together <laughs> and, and having something to play together for like the first time. They're usually easier than this one, like the first violin parts, um, yeah. not as difficult as this one would be. I okay. think it's like with the bird effect, it's a lot of jumping around, lots of short staccato notes, lots of jumping um, 16th notes that really make like the bird sound, but that's generally harder technique so easier like earlier ones are generally easier yeah okay to work on okay okay yes and you touched on another uh important aspect of this that it has a programmatic title um which uh to be honest i'm not sure who applied that title um i don't think our anthology tells us you know um sometimes titles were like applied by composers themselves, but other times they're applied by uh, people who heard them and played uh, these pieces, or uh, even by publishers as well. So I'm not entirely sure where it comes from, but uh, you can definitely hear how it fits and uh, also see how it fits as well. So um, the last work I want to show you uh, we won't listen, I don't, I don't think we'll listen to all of it, but this is an example of a late quartet. So this is Opus 76, which has uh, the, the title, The Emperor. So this was composed uh, around the time of Napoleon's uh, wars and invasion of the Austrian Empire. Uh, so we can kind of, uh, well, Haydn was commissioned to write uh, Austria's national anthem. So, Gott erhatte Franz den Kaiser. So, God, uh, God save the king, basically, but God protect um, Franz the Kaiser. Um, it was sung in theaters in honor of the Austrian emperor's birthday. Uh, so the 12th of February, 1797. Um, so the movement we're listening to, uh, the main melodic material. So it was uh, the national anthem for the Austrian Empire, but it's actually, um, the, it's, it's been adapted into Germany's national anthem as well. Uh, so it comes from the second movement, and what's interesting here is that um, it's kind of like uh, the second movements of uh, Haydn's Surprise Symphony, um, or the, the one that we looked at called The Queen, La Reine. Um, the second movement here is also a theme and variations movement on this particular melody.
so like I said, I don't think we'll listen to all of it, but maybe just enough to get the sense of the uh, melodic material here. And I'm just going to start it from the very
about you and maybe this is only special to Haley, but I really appreciated that the second variation featured a cello solo on the melody. <laughs> In early string quartets like this, it's usually heavy violin and then um, first violin and then everyone else gets stuck with um, harmonies or things to support the violin. So whenever like composers do stuff like that where it features another instrument, it's really nice. It is um, nice. Haydn actually really liked cello. He wrote concertos for cello and I've played one of them and they're really cool. No way. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Well, the cello is beautiful and um, I, I'm not, I, I didn't uh, pull up a score for this. I'm not sure how many variations are in there, but I feel like even rarer than um, maybe a cello solo is like a viola solo. <laughs> Our per violas, right? <laughs> it's uh, it's more fun we, when we have violas out there, but you know. Uh, so theme and variations, just one last thing on them. They're, they kind of have motivic development like built in. Like that's kind of like the basis is just having a theme and then being able to play around with it in um, the, the, the coming variations. Um, but I think even still, Haydn is able to incorporate that development even uh, without having to write in theme and variations. But um, this won't be the last set of variations we'll look at. And it's uh, really interesting when we start looking at Beethoven um, and talking about variations, maybe we'll touch on keyboard variations, but I'm not sure, or piano variations, but uh, are there questions that folks have? I don't know if everybody heard this at the beginning, but um, I, I just want everybody to know that I'm taking Ethan's concern seriously, that not everybody may be aware that this is how we're doing things from now on. I just didn't want to send you continuous amounts of emails and stuff, but maybe we should have a daily reminder on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays about our Zoom class that people can either choose to accept or ignore. Um, again, attendance is not required, but it is appreciated. So. All right. Uh, well, uh, that being said, we'll be in touch. And uh, like I said, I'm just trying to be sensitive about too many emails, but uh, expect some more from me uh, before Friday, especially. All right. Uh, as always, if you have questions, please let me know uh, as soon as you can. Um, but otherwise, I, I thank all of you for showing up today. And again, we'll be in touch. So be safe, stay at home, stay well, stay hydrated. You know, it's important. <laughs> all right. Well, I am going to end the meeting and I will see you all on Friday. Is it weird that I'm like, I, I feel like saying like, comment, and uh, subscribe after this? It's no good. All right. <laughs> I'll see you guys on Friday.